<laughs> Teamwork. Okay. Yeah. Um, please stand if you're able. Um, if not, you can do this in your seat just really quickly. We've been talking about perspective and intention. And with that in mind, I would like to just reset for a moment and please all take a very deep breath. Let it out. And please remember that what we're hearing is perspectives from different people and listen with intent. That's all we ask. Thank you. You can sit down. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'd like to invite each of you to introduce yourselves and say what you do and also tell me about a time that you felt like you really belonged. So, my name is Maria Norberg, and I am the CEO and co-founder of an organization named Teknikvinnor, which means women in technology in Swedish. Uh, and we run the largest network for women in technology. We have 28,000 active members every single month, and we work with gender equality and uh, inclusion at technology companies. And I was thinking about the belonging question, and um, one time, and for a couple of years, I was singing a choir. And at the choir, it was all about your voice. It doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, what you have been doing that day, but it's only about your voice and how you can contribute to the group of people that we had in the room at that time. Amazing. Vishakha. Hi, I'm Vishakha, and I have been a film actor in India. Um, I've acted in almost 15 films, and I've had the privilege of acting out women of substances during my uh, performances. And I moved on to being a film producer in 2012, having produced three films, two of which have been selected and screened at the Cannes Film Festival. Now, two years ago, I ventured into the tech space. I became a tech entrepreneur. And I must say that when it came to moving the dial, for me, it was I who moved the dial. But that could not have been possible if I had, had not had the support of my family and accelerator programs like the Zone Startups in India and especially Next Canada here. And that's the reason I'm here. Great. <clears throat> my name is Jackie Steele. Um, I'm the founder of Enjoy Diversity and Inclusion in uh, Tokyo, Japan. I'm actually from Vancouver, but I've spent much of the last 20 years in rural Japan and also in Tokyo. Um, I'm a researcher and political scientist uh, teaching in law and politics about strategies, about how we uh, can diversify and bring the voices of women and diversity into politics, parliaments, policy, and the law that we, governs our, our shared space. Um, I think a moment when I felt uh, belonging that was very striking for me was about 17 years ago in my rural community in Nagano. Um, I had worked for three years um, trying to bring internationalization and uh, new ideas uh, from Canada to my rural uh, town. And the mayor, as a parting gift uh, to me, had written a Japanese scroll. Um, and he had, he had recognized the Japanese kanji or character name that I use, which means young hope. And uh, there's a lot of resistance to me using this kanji name. Um, people often resisted it because as a white foreigner, you know, you're not a part of Japan, why are you using kanji for your name? And he had really, you know, wanted to honor that I was using this name in my workplace, that it was a part of my identity, and so he dedicated it and he wrote it um, in, those, in those words. So that really, um, that really struck home. Erica. Hi, everybody. My name is Erica Keswin. I'm from New York City. I am the author of this book, Bring Your Human to Work. Um, which is, you know, about creating a, a more human workplace, you know, not just for women, but for everyone. And my work in DNI, there's a chapter in the book called Playing the Long Game. And as we know, DNI is a long game, but it's talking to companies about creating an opportunity to have people work in a more flexible way. It's about making sure they have what I call intentional work practices, parental leave, bereavement leave, which in the US, you know, it's a global panel, I'm our US representative, we're not so great at that. And the third part is having what I call enlightened supply chains. So not only looking at DNI and belonging within your own company, but who do you do business with and thinking down that supply chain. So I'm so excited to be here. I, I brought the book because when you asked us to talk about a time when we felt belonging, to me it's about, and we were talking about this in the green room, it's about when, when you felt seen. And I think most recently when I, when I truly felt seen was right after my book came out, I flew to Vermont to give a talk to 250 HR leaders who are thinking about how they bring their human to work within their organizations. I gave my talk, there were tears, they came up to me, and so, I felt that I had been seen, my work had been seen, and 
to me, being seen is also about giving, you know, giving something and not just receiving. So that would be my moment. Well, I ask the belonging question often because I feel like you can't really move the dial until you feel like you are part of a community. So with that in mind, um, each of you talk about um, what you see as the most significant barrier to women in the tech ecosystem right now. What is preventing them from belonging in your experience? Like, first of all, I think it's like a large question is fundamentally that we have to change the norm of technology and who is the stereotypical person working within technology. And that's something that we've been taught since we are kids. Like, who's changing the light bulb at home? Uh, what does our teachers do? And what can we do to change the norm of who is the person working with technology? Uh, and to do that, we have to make sure that we have the role models. And we need to have role models, not only the superstars, we have to have role models at every single level within organizations and the community. Uh, we have to be able to see one person above us, one or two levels above us, not only the stars out there. And then to have more honest, truthful, and open conversations with everyone, uh, both men, women, uh, non-binaries, every person talking about and we need a change in the society. Shaka. So uh, I would agree, uh, you know, what you can't see, you can't be. And for me, I have not been a woman of STEM. Um, I was a film actor and I did my graduation in business studies and post-graduation in advertising. So there I was an actor, a film producer and a tech entrepreneur, and all the three career choices I was never prepared for, but I did take it on. Um, having said that, you know, <coughs> two years ago when I first started making my chatbot for celebrities, uh, I was all over the news, uh, and that was a lot of public adulation. Having said that again, there was a lot of imposter syndrome that I went through personally, and there was no single woman mentor that I could look up to who could guide me through that phase, and that was really debilitating for me, you know? So yes, definitely more role models. Um, I think speaking from the Japanese context, we see um, still fairly strong degrees of systemic discrimination that are both overt and covert. And so that's, I think, a really big challenge to then try and move within those spaces, knowing there is these different facets of, of discrimination. I think what, how that plays out in practice is women often feel exceptionally isolated. They're one of the only ones in the room, um, always in all of the spaces that they're at. And so finding role models, finding a peer group that can be your sort of support structure that helps build up your morale when you're feeling like you're, you're not confident or you need support. And certainly, um, just even thinking about research I've done on young women in, in post-disaster Japan, I mean, one of the things that really was critical to them as young leaders in their communities rebuilding after the disaster was that they had a network of 40, then 90, and all young women who would then connect on Facebook or they connect through other social media, and they could just feel that there was a peer group out there who had their back and that they weren't alone and that although it is hard and it's an uphill battle, they're not wrong that their, their cause and their passion and what they're trying to move forward on, their ideas, um, that they're right and they need to be encouraged to move forward. So breaking that isolation and breaking out of this pressure to conform to a masculine model of workplace, um, of long working hours in tech or in Japan in most companies, um, challenging this idea that you have to be a corporate warrior, um, that women have multiple identities, men have multiple identities, but they don't sort of have that recognized when they show up at work. So um, bringing their whole selves and their whole human is so key to break the isolation. Great. So I, I break it down into three areas. There are cultural, barriers, there's company barriers, and then there's human barriers. We can be barriers for ourselves. Um, on the company front, I, I will share a story. I was at a company yesterday talking to them about their, their rituals. I'm actually writing a new book on, on rituals. And as women, I think we can agree, yes, it can be a, a stereotype, but by and large, we are caregivers by nature. So whether we have kids, whether we have elderly parents, our friends, our pets, we tend to have a lot to do after the work day ends, right? I think we could all agree with that. So I was, so I was at this company, and one of the things is called Tauk. It's a travel company. I was blown away. They, they, the head of HR, head of culture said to me, we try to think about what is the problem we're trying to solve? How can we help our employees, the, the, these women? They go home from work, and they have so much to do. And so we know we're entering the holiday season, at least in the US, Thanksgiving and Christmas. So she said, well, you know, a lot of people are stressed. And she said, we 
are giving people an extra day off between Thanksgiving and Christmas to take care of their holiday stuff. But even more interesting than that, and sometimes it's the little things that can make a big difference, they have something called holiday helpers where anybody in the company can bring in a bag full of gifts and people can get their presents wrapped at work. And again, this might seem like a small thing, but how can we help, again, especially women that tend to go home and then are running to Target or all these stores to do all the, the second shift work to make it easier to be yourself at work so you can actually focus on the work? You know, I have a thousand more examples where that came from, but literally it was yesterday and I thought it was pretty interesting. It's amazing. Um, I just want to be mindful of the time, but I would love to talk about solutions. So if each of you can address the barrier that you discussed, whether it's imposter syndrome or um, emotional labor or not feeling like you're part of a community, what will you give the audience to take away for something that they can do in their own work lives to mitigate that? I just want to like start off by saying like one of the most fundamental things that I I believe in is not is not the minority should change the majority like it's it's we need to be all together to make a change it's not all the women that should make the change as women but there are things that we can do and um, there are a lot of things we can do uh, but first of all to include people and have tough conversations and honest conversations uh, to get the understanding. Um, uh, so I feel two things, one is personally and one as, as a team that, or as, as, a, as collectively that we can do. Uh, on a personal level, what I do is I merge technology to tell stories now, uh, to get the message out. And as a team, I do a very simple thing nowadays, which is, so LinkedIn as a platform was a very new platform for me because I was always on other social media platforms as a celebrity back in India. Now what I do on LinkedIn is I do a very simple thing. Every time I get a request from a woman, I always accept it. And that's my way of building a community. Um, I think one of the most important things that I try to do all the time is I use language and I understand that language is power and how we speak about our reality and speak our reality into existence. So for me, that's mean using in Japanese the Japanese term for diversity. I don't use the import word, I use the actual original Japanese word. Diversity is inherent to Japanese society, it's always been a part of it. So reminding that there is those histories of that inclusive view of Japanese-ness is I think really important. I think it's also important to talk about men's diversity. Um, we often sort of fail to talk really explicitly about the different layers of diversity and the multiple roles and identities that men juggle. And so one of the strategies we're doing in Japan is to focus on fathers and fathers' empowerment. So I'm certainly, through my work, trying to highlight that if we want the move to dial for women and equality at work, we need that fathers and Japanese fathers to be able to have permission to go home and see their kids and be active fathers at home. So how do we support fathers in that sense is one of the other strategies that we're doing. I would say when we think about our list of things to do, at some point in your day, put it aside and get up and walk down the hall. That if you don't invest in relationships, it will be very hard to move the dial for yourself and for your company. Well, round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> Thank you all so much.